my time starts now. We are from observation physician assisted suicide is defined as doctor's involvement in measures designed to end the patient's life. And it is important here in today's round, what we're discussing is not should we legalize the choice between live or die. It's in cases of an currently incurable terminal disease where the patients have less than six painful and expensive months to live, should we offer them the choice of a peaceful death instead? Two part from Morgan's side proposition. First, we will prove to you that why it is morally justified for terminal ill patients to obtain this choice. Second, we will focus on the realistic benefits to the rights of our society. Contention one, patients will According to Washington Post 2018, there are now 45% of terminal ill patients who are in urgent need of physician assisted suicide. To point A, dignity. A good death requires control and certainty at the end of life. Long name for this sudden death and delayed deaths are seen as worse because they violate over plans and disrupt over sense of control. Feynman 2014, that forced prolonging of life can just cause just as much as loss of freedom as death. In healthcare, legal and doctor orders can be overly restrictive and erase the wishes of the actual patient. The opposition side deprived the, right to, uh, uh, the patient's right to uh, die. Force them to painfully and unwilling, uh, unwillingly live against their wishes. And we believe that promoting a society that prioritizes dignity would be significantly better. So point B, prolonged suffering. The illegality of physician assisted suicide creates problems even for uncontroversial treatment like withdrawing life support. Long name for that the distinctions about letting diversers actively cooling are disrupted in medicine and passively letting someone die can prolong suffering. For example, a man suffered for 12 hours after struggling to breathe after his ventilator was removed before he died. The hospital refusing to admit the person condemned him to a similar suffering on his own, and that there are limited resources to using them to keep people alive against their own wishes is not the right thing to do. Contention two, social benefits. Step one, eight, families. First, less grief. The l relative and friends of physician assisted suicide patients has less grief than those who naturally died after sufferings. According to NCPI, the percentage of traumatic grief was two times lower for PS patients and families. Second, less money wasted. Reported by CBS News, MO and Betty estimated that legalizing physician assisted suicide could save each year as much as $627 million in the U.S. for families from other ineffective and expensive treatment. According to the CPS, the median household income was uh, almost six, uh, sixty sixty thousand dollars in 2018. The average family of such a patient could save twenty thousand dollars, which is one third of their entire income if the patient chose PS. So point B, depressed people. Currently, stigma around mental health act as a barrier to people seeking help within the health healthcare system, and the stigma issues within the healthcare system can be easily solved with some training of the healthcare providers. Physician assisted suicide act as a magnet for people with depression who are normally reluctant to get tested. When they request PS, they get mental health screening and the depressed get mental health assistance. So it helps treat people with depression who otherwise might not have sought mental health care. So point C, organ donations. After legalizing PS in Canada, Dutchman 2020 reports a surge in organ donation by people facing the end of life. In just a few years, medically assisted deaths now account for 5% of organ donations in Canada. For example, they donated 18 organs and 90 tissue samples in Ontario, probably saving dozens of lives. Also, the surge in organ donation is important because Canadian registration for organ donation has been declining for years. In America alone, over 100,000 currently need organ transplants and 20 people die each day waiting for one. Contingent three, over medication. So point A, painkiller overdose. In current medical means, the major means for those terminally ill patients to react is by taking extremely painful and ineffective painkillers. And according to the U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention in 2018, an average of 41 people die each day from overdose involving prescription opioids, totally nearly 15,000 deaths. We see that even without physician assisted suicide, those people have already died during the process of painkillers intake and die in a painful and expensive way. So point B, underground According to 2018, 16% of doctors already have given at least one prescription to have some deaths, even though it is not legal. According to Death with Dignity 16, scientific journal articles have demonstrated that doctors all across the country already dispense life ending medications at the request of patients for family. By passing this law, the council will stop the sort of light hallway prescription that now happens with a wink and nod and shine a bright light on the process. So, for all these reasons about, we are so proud to propose. Thank you. Um, can I call for a card that says PS help people with depression? Thank you.
Okay, is everyone ready? All right, um, so without further ado. My four minute constructive starts now. We negate, we define terminally ill as having a disease that cannot be cured, it will eventually lead to death. We define physician assisted suicide as intentionally providing a patient with a medical means to commit suicide. Contention one, perverse incentive. According to Rehnquist 94, legalizing physician assisted suicide could subject patients to a risk of subtle abuse and undue influence in end of life situations, especially patients whose autonomy and well being are already compromised by poverty. They may be denied or discouraged treatment and funneled towards assisted suicide. Two explanations. First, profit motive. Act 14 states that healthcare companies and district makers use PAS to increase profit by denying treatment. Assisted suicide doesn't exist in a vacuum. The profit driven healthcare system urges doctors to reduce care in order to cut costs. In 2017, internal medicine professor Brian Callister tried to transfer two patients to California and Oregon for procedures not performed at his hospital. Representatives from two insurance companies denied those transfer and suggested assisted suicide. Lethal prescriptions are cheaper than the pricey terminal treatment by an order of magnitude, thus incentivizing district makers to prefer assisted suicide. Furthermore, Oregon instituted healthcare rationing for the poor in the same year that the state's assisted suicide initiative became law in 1994. That year, the Oregon Medical Assistance Program, OAMP, terminated funding for 167 healthcare services. Four years later, when assisted suicide law went into effect, OAMP directors put lethal prescriptions on the list of treatments, categorized as comfort care. At the same time, OAMP slashed Medicaid funding for more than 150 services crucial with people with disability, people with terminal illnesses, and for older adults, while further trimming already limited funding for in-home support. Second, saving medical resources. Medical shortages are increasingly common. Schwartz 2020 finds that by 2030, 80 million health workers will be needed versus half of that in 2013. But experts predict we'll be 15 million short. Two out of five US doctors will retire in the next decade. Thus, the AMC predicts a shortage of about 50,000 to 120,000 US doctors by 2032. Thus, there's a low hanging incentive to call patients rather than solve shortages. Kirkpatrick and Mueller 2020 claims that for years, British health workers have been advised to withhold resources from weak patients during public crisis. Given that such prioritization already occurs, one imagines that providing a justified system and tool to kill will not improve the situation. If the opponent tries to narrow the scope of this debate by insisting on an idealized world in which proper enforcement trumps perverse incentives, the opponents assume an even higher burden of proof to demonstrate the mechanics of such enforcement and how it could reliably proven to curb human nature. Contention two, legal slippery slope. Malta 18 states, quote, in 2002, euthanasia was legalized for adults in Belgium who met certain criteria. The main one being that they must be in constant and unbearable physical or psychological pain resulting from an accident or incurable illness. Now in the status quo, people including children have been euthanized for a wild range of conditions, including depression, blindness, deafness, gender identity crisis, and anorexia, end quote. This suggests that as time progresses, not only does the criteria widen, but suicide is also normalized. The result is increase in rates of suicide. JAACAP 19 finds the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why was associated with 29% increase in suicide rates among US youth ages 10 to 17 following the show's release, likely because the series glorified the act of suicide. Once you publicly, once you publicly condone suicide, you remove the stigma from suicide, which leads to our impact. Also considered, in 2002, just 24 people were euthanized in Belgium. Between 2016 and 2017, there were record around 4,000 cases reported to authorities. The same trend is happening to the Netherlands and Oregon. Lastly, while the philosophical or physician, context of physician-assisted suicide are nearly infinite, the real world is not. In the real world in which where we live, the number of practical consequences for physician-assisted suicide is large. The burden rests on the opponent to obviate or justify these practical consequences rather than merely speaking in theoretical terms. We negate, thank you. I may have the first question, time starting now. Do you understand that euthanasia and physician assisted suicide are two different concepts and totally different kind of things? Uh, yes, we do. So can I ask a question? Yes. All right, so you talk about prolonging suffering in your contention one, right? Yes. So what if like, the patient wants to live a longer life? Shouldn't we grant their, them the, rights to, like, the right to live 
Yes, of course, we are not depriving the rights of the patients who want to live a longer life. However, what overall condition one is suggesting is that according to Washington Post 2018, currently 45% of the terminal ill patients are in urgent needs of physician assisted suicide. Now, may I have a question? Wait, so they're Sorry, asking for physician assisted suicide? Uh, yeah, sure. Can I have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about like suicide, how suicides are no normalized, and the Netherlands have an increased suicide rates of 20 uh, percent. Could you please prove uh, the unique causation of physician assisted suicide instead of a correlation? Okay, so our warrant is that once you publicly condone suicide, you're telling everybody that it's, you remove the stigma and you're telling everybody that suicide's okay, and you, and that's basically leads to an increase in uh, suicide. Could you please rates. justify can, why can I, suicide can, is okay, not can okay? Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, of yeah. course. Okay, so about your 45 percent, like uh, people who need physician assisted suicide, are they? actively requesting for physician assisted suicide or are you just making an assumption because they're in pain? It's not making an assumption, it's according to Washington Post. Do you have, if you have any, like if you're dubious about the card, Wait, you can check so it. Wait, so you're saying 45% of patients in the United States actively no, request terminal, physician assisted suicide? I mean terminal ill patients and it seems like my opponents do not clearly distinguish the difference between intonation and physician assisted suicide. Physician assisted suicide is that if even after you you have the request of physician assisted suicide, you got the little drug prescriptions, you can still make the decision on your own. However, intonation is directly inject uh, the little uh, index. Okay, yeah, sure. Yes, well, you I, may I have a question. Okay, so uh, you say you will help people with depression, right? Yes. Have you have any like real evidence shows that it actually is happening? Like people are cared because physician. Yes. Okay. So basically, the thing is this: for those depressed people, I want a number. Do you have a number? Like, or do you have cases? Like all the depressed people who yeah, yeah, go, yeah. like just the depressed people will get assisted. Yeah, yeah that's that's right. your card is basically citing a guy like saying the logic between it, but I want to see the actual evidence well, of that happening. Well, basically, like basically your entire case is based on your own that's, logical that's, 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 that's not right? true. We have plenty of evidence, and we even if we don't, we will explain why well, that we okay. don't have evidence. We can move on. Can I have a question? Yeah, sure. So Although you didn't you answer my question. So, do you believe a life without autonomy is not life anymore? Without true autonomy over a person's body, it's uh, not a meaningful life. Anymore. We would say that if we grant the pa terminal patients more autonomy, and we like like granting by granting them more autonomy will hurt the society and compromise How? the social order, because patients. So you're like, that's our entire case, okay. right? So you're advocating a world where citizens don't have autonomy, correct? Wait a sec, everyone ready for the um, pro rebuttal four minutes? Ready, time, wait a sec, I need to use my left hand, how is it? Okay. Right, right, cause like you, your right hand is slide. Uh, time starting now. Starting with opponents have zero frameworks, which means our framework, including both moral principle and social benefits, should be taken as a standard of judgment in today's debate. Moving on to their first contention regarding perversive intention. Their entire logic is basically suggesting due to financial coercion for those poor people who couldn't afford Medicare or palliative agencies' uh, entire co cost. Like we have insurers, we have family members, we even have governmental agencies that coerce them into practicing PS. There's sole evidence of talking about two patients when a doctor tried to move them from like to Oregon, some hospitals, in, in, the insurance company suggests for uh, PAF, but no specific evidence regarding whether these two, uh, two uh, patients exactly were killed or not. First, we turn their entire argumentation by suggesting that first PAS would actually be self-complementary to the traditional Medicare system. We already proven to you in our point that PS saved more than 627 million for the United States at all. And if we move it to a global scale, it would be 990 million saved for other sections of Medicare, which means we're actually saving money and stop the meaningless occupation of medical resources, since we already know terminal ill patients are gonna die sooner or later, the only difference they're gonna make is that when they die sooner, experience very suffering six months, they're gonna squeeze every cent out of their family member's pocket to pay for hospice programs. And moving on, let's talk about this alternative about traditional healthcare versus PF. We first tell you that the vast majority of those terminal ill patients are rejected from palliative care or other traditional Medicare agency. WHO reported in 2020, only 14% of people who need palliative care can receive it. According to Logue, most hospice programs reject patients from 
are mentally incapacitated. And second of all, these cares are ineffective. A relatively low quality of life for 42.8% in last three weeks and 63.2% in last one week. In these nursing homes, those patients are getting zero autonomy and zero quality of life as well. And most important of all, they're costing too much. National Public Radio reports that several palliative care agencies will charge nearly 60K annually. And we also see average American household income is also 60K, which means the entire family are gonna squeeze out every single pocket, uh, every single sin out their pocket to pay for the very expensive palliative care. Now moving on to second contention regarding slippery slope. Two response. First, empirical evidence proves there is no slippery slope. Quote Charles Blank, users are predominantly elderly, white, and well educated. Almost all patients are in hospice and almost all take the medication at home after telling loved ones of their decision. There is no current factual support for so-called slippery slope concern. According to the Ramlick report, PS case in Oregon over seven years remain very steady and only consists 0.3% of all deaths. Second, we turn their entire argument that proving legalizing PS would only reduce underground PS and voluntary loss of life. According to Chambers, in countries where PAS was unlawful in the early 1990s, such as Australia and Belgium, the incidence of active involuntary use in Asia was five times higher than in the Netherlands. 3.5%, 3.2%, and 0.7% respectively. According to NEJM, 16% of doctors already have given at least one prescription to hasten death, even though it is not legal. Which means in our opponent's circumstances, even if PS is not legalized, these patients, especially those poor patients who their opponents have already answered, like they give them zero choice, but either a drawn out death or seeking for illegal channel to commit PS. In that circumstances, more involuntary euthanasia and more procedure out of regulation will occur and more lives will be involuntarily lost, which means we turn their entire impact regarding slippery slope and views of uh, PS. Now moving on to suicidal contagion. This entire logic is absolutely absurd. With our opponents providing zero evidence about how much suicidal rates has occurred simply because of legalization of PS, no correlation is not causation. We first tell you that the key factor in determining societal right and media reports is called governmental intervention. According to WHO, uh, WHO already has guidelines with this of six do's and six don'ts for media professionals. It has been suggested that implementation of the WHO reporting guidelines could decrease the negative impact of suicide. The famous norm of gone with the wind could probably no uh, like no novelize slavery, but that doesn't necessarily mean the entire society they impact that impact by that. Also, among the top 10 suicidal race country in this entire world, there are Lithuania, Russia, Guyana, South Korea, Belarus, Suriname, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Latvia, a lot of strange names, but none of these countries already have PS legalized. And that's why we see legalizing PS wouldn't bring a social norm to this. Thank you. Um, okay, so if everybody's ready, my time is gonna start now. First, judge, look to your flows. Every single time they say an impact is non-unique, it already happens in our world. That does not mean we can go ahead and make it worse. That does not mean we can go ahead and condone it and legalize it and put it on a platform where it can be made into entirely different negative impact. Now, they, we, they say we don't have a framework. We tell you we literally do. Practical benefits should always be preferred over theoretical benefits because PAS is being legalized in the real world. They, didn't, they did not respond to this. Um, now onto their argument about underground PAS. We say that actually proves that regulation is failing. If underneath the status quo, regulation preventing PAS is being ignored, then if they implement any regulation or try to enforce it, then how this would actually prove that 
regulation would be broken in their word as well because what evidence is there that new regulations will be taken with greater legal seriousness. Also, this argument basically tells us that we also achieve right to die in their world, so their argument about right to die has less um, stance. Now, going to their argument, uh, also our issue is that if, when it becomes legalized, that's when our impacts start rolling out. When you put it on a public platform and you call it a medical treatment as justification, that's when our slippery slope already comes out. Now, they talk about abuse. They say it, in their response to our abuse says it helps the medical industry. They talk about saving money. That's literally exactly our warrant. The saving money is exactly why subtle coercion is going to be pushed. Money is never going to outweigh humanity. Now, going to their argument about euthanasia. The common area of euthanasia and PAS are that they are killing instead of curing. The similarity is what links our arguments. The method doesn't affect our argument or disprove anything because unless they can prove the end impact of killing instead of curing doesn't happen under both circumstances, they can't cut off our link. Now, they say it's not possible to die from not explicitly requesting PAS. We tell you it 100% is. When physicians suggest or encourage or lobby for PAS before a patient has even asked about it or thought about it or requested it, we tell you about a pro-PAS lobbyist that consulted with patients for 61 consecutive cases in Oregon. That in itself is already problematic because it's under the pretense that suicide is an acceptable medical treatment. We tell you once this happens, once it's popularized and normalized, it undermines other types of treatment and results in a legal, sleeper, legal slippery slope of widening criteria. Now talk about the right to die value. We tell you this has no offensive value because we're not saying you can't die, you can't commit suicide. We're saying we never deny the right to die. We're just saying we can't condone it and we can't legalize it and we can't assist you in the process. Um, in both worlds, you can achieve the right to die. It's just that in our world, it's more difficult and that is not a bad thing. If we make it easier, aka in the pro world, that's when normalization happens and that's when slippery slope happens. And actually we tell you the right to die is based on the right to choice, right? But we tell you in their world, they take away more choices. Um, there's always right to treatment, but legalizing PAS would undermine treatment. I'll expand on this later. And we would actually outweigh because we're advocating for the right to live. But yes, they're advocating for the right to die. We tell you about people who'd be pushed into PAS who otherwise would have survived. And choosing the widening of criteria, which will result in more suicide, it's the value of life versus value of death. Judge you vote for us on that every single time. They talk about relieving pain. We tell you that the impact is small. Only 5% of cases is because of unrelieved pain. And we return this because PAS would under undermine progress for pain reduction treatment. Palliative care and other treatment always gets worse in their world. It doesn't matter under the status quo what's it like because it gets worse in their world. By considering PAS an adequate solve for pain, it could remove incentive or need or interest for funding, research, and even administration. This is because under the pro-narrative, people in severe pain will turn to PAS, so what's the point in pain reduction treatment, right? We tell you in Oregon about 167 healthcare services that were terminated after the legalization of suicide, um, PAS, and then later on, four years later, 150 more services were terminated. We tell you about the Journal of Palliative Care that showed dying patients in Oregon are nearly twice as likely to experience pain during the last week of life compared to before the law took effect. Now, go on to their argument about organ transplantation. We tell you the impact is small. The donors would have to be terminally ill, voluntarily looking access to PAS and be a qualified doctor. This would narrify the scope uh, immensely, which means in Canada, which is what they bring up their evidence about actually, according to a report by the New England Journal of Medicine, nearly two thirds of the people who qualify for PAS are ineligible to donate organs. And also we tell you about perverse incentive. We extend this from constructive, where we tell you patients will be denied treatment and encouraged to take a PAS by insurance companies or pressured to do so under the obligation of save resources. And three, this sets a terrible precedent. It's essentially telling a terminally ill patient their life is invaluable, only their body is. The pro is using the people as a means to an end. The patient's decision should never be determined by somebody else or something else. It always should be about the patient first, and the second isn't, that's when all our negative impacts start rolling out. Now, going to our argument about autonomy, they don't achieve this, they'll tell you about abuse and our contention, incentive to save money, and incentive to generate money, which they actually support in their rebuttal speech, and we actually turn this because in their world, autonomy gets worse for specific groups of patients, and also, they, um, they undermine choice because they undermine treatment, which means that the other choices that they might be able to choose would be undermined. Now, going to their argument about um, giving a specific number, we give them evidence, but there's always going to be a reporting disintensive for malpractice. Thank you. Across. Okay, ten seconds for them. Okay, I believe I have first question. Okay, time starting now. First question, can you quantify the impact of the first contention by directly telling me how many patients were, like, have been denied treatment? How many? Right, we tell you that Just it a number. Is, okay. Just a number. Can I, ex okay, let's say, we tell you about reporting disincentive, we don't have a specific number, but we can prove the impact Thank is you. happening. Thank you, no number is good, you can have a quest. Okay, right, so you talk about how our slippery slope link doesn't work, but you don't actually touch our link. Can you tell me why it doesn't work? Your link is basically suggests that as long as we legalize PAS, we'll go to euthanasia without providing actual evidence mm, to prove it. No, Let's that's go. not what we're saying. We're saying once you legalize PAS, it's going to become normalized, justified as a medical treatment, and uh, then it's how? going to be expanded. How? 
Okay, so you're telling people this is a medical treatment. This isn't something that kills you. This is something that medical treatment should be something uh, that cures you, right? There. So wait you're saying there. killing is solvency. That's what you're telling people. I'm not here. suggesting killing is solvency. I'm yes, suggesting you are. Let really the patient PAS is a medical treatment. You're wait, wait, telling me killing is solvency. Wait, 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 wait. Like in your circumstance, what should these patients do? Like for those people who couldn't afford any other kind of alternative, what should they do? Like they couldn't afford uh, normal medical treatment or palliative care. What should they do? In your scenario. Um, okay, so firstly, that's an issue with the system then. So you're saying instead so of trying to fix the system, let's kill people inside the system, wait right? A sec, wait we a sec. wouldn't say that's a very good What's solve. your solvency for, for this systematic flaw? Like this structural we violence say that is it gets already worse there. How do you solve world, it? Right? No world uh, has solvency, but it gets worse in their world because it undermines uh, how, treatment how, and it How are we getting industry. worse since we're already generating $990 million for the system? Yeah, that's our warrant for our first contention about how You're that increases so, incentive for abuse you basically and coercion. Yes, and yet you failed to provide a number suggesting how many patients have exactly been abused. Okay, uh, we'll extend okay. on that in summary and how that's not important sure enough. to may I have damage a, our argument. May I have a question? Or, or if you want to have a question, whatever. Okay, uh, okay I mean, I'll have a question. Okay. Uh, the right to life and the right of freedom. Which one is more important in your scenario? Life or freedom? Which one? If it's life versus death, we would say life is more important. Of course life versus death, life is more important. I'm asking for freedom, I'm not asking for death. Freedom, right, so. Oh, freedom, thank you, your question. Okay, okay, sure. Um, can I, so why is that important to, in today's debate? I don't, I don't think I need to explain my entire strategy to you during a crossfire round. I I've mean, got we have one minute left, question. I'm I'm sure you could. Okay, so the explanation regarding this is that we're suggesting, while you suggest in your own rebuttal speech, talking about how right to life is more important than the right to die, the right to die somehow demonstrate the right to choice, like, per, like quote unquote, your own words. And that's how exactly what we see, like in slavery, what Connellas would say to the slaves, I'm empowering you with life, I'm not gonna kill you, but you're gonna work for me and sacrifice your right to freedom. So, this you, is, is, so is exactly I said freedom like is more important, right? Which means you're taking that onto the crux of choice. We tell you about undermining treatment, which also undermines other choices. Wait a second. And we wait, tell wait you about we actually achieve their choice of right to die, it's just how, in our world. How, how does it undermine other treatments? Since I already asked That's you, like, like for those who couldn't afford other treatment, what are they gonna do? We tell you, if you can't afford other treatment in both worlds, in their world it gets worse because you're actually undermining the quality of the treatment it as well. It does not get worse because they get PS and they get a peaceful ending of their life. Thank you.
Anyone not ready? My time starts now. First of all, a quick clarification on the framework. When we talk about real estate investment, we are not saying that we value money and we value those utilitarianism impacts over life. We are saying that any logical assertions need empirical evidence to support. We see the uh, opposition side today overclaim their uh, overclaim their impacts without giving us any empirical evidence or statistics to support. Now moving on to specific contentions. Let's first talk about proposition side. We, we over first question we raise up is about the patient's world. So point A, we talk about dignity. The, the, the opposition side world say, wow, well, they provide a harder world to die, but we do not see why life without autonomy and dignity and being deprived of freedom is better. We believe that we should offer citizens the life with dignity and autonomy. The opposition have felt to justify themselves why the force living against the pa patient's own wishes is a better situation. And second of all, they're advocating the right to live. However, judge, please realize the choice is not leave or that. Because for those terminal ill, Ill patients who would inevitably die in six months, we're only talking about is it good to offer them a second option for those who cannot access to palliative care and to access to hospital care. And sec also we talk about prolonged Suffering. They only say that palliative care will get, uh, get worse in the oversight of the house. However, we, we see that palliative care and physician assisted suicide is not mutually exclusive. PS benefits uh, PS actually benefits palliative care. According to Oregon Public Health Division, reports that 93% of patients who opt for PS were on hospice care. And another card from Motion showed that after legalization of physician assisted suicide, 30% of physicians increased their number of referrals to hospital care, and 76% increased their knowledge of pain medication. We see that physician assisted suicide and palliative care are not mutually exclusive. It's, uh, uh, are not two mutually exclusive things. And then we move on to our second condition, we talk about social benefits. They basically have no responses to over 20 cases for each family. We say this is not incentive to, to, for, the, for them to cure, to cure the patients. It's basically said that they are not affordable for the expensive palliative, uh, palliative care, not only uh, is only accessible to 40% of the total entire population national wide according to WHO. And second of all, we talk about organ donations. They only say, okay, it's not unique. However, we say this is a unique benefit on the proposition side because physicians assisted suicide leads to death in minutes, whereas death after withdrawing life-sustaining treatment could occur after several hours or even day. It makes sure, like physician assisted suicide, makes sure organs like liver, kidney, and pancreas remain sustain uh, usable. So we believe that by respecting the uh, patient's autonomy and also respecting their own wills, because the organ donations is signed a contract with uh, uh, with the patients on their own, we believe that it's overall a better impact on oversight of houses. We, uh, we also talk about painkillers over those, which, which was entirely dropped by our opponents. We said that even in the status quo, they have already died like 15,000 deaths already happened in the status quo. We already told you that involuntary underground insulation is taking place. If we do not legalize, the situation will be even worse. They have clearly no responses. And now move on to the opposition side's case. The first of, first of all, talk about incentive. However, they only give you the logic link without no empirical evidence. And we say there is no trade-off between palliative care and, uh, and physician assisted suicide. The second kind of slippery slope, they're simply twisting the definition of insulation and the physician assisted suicide. However, we've already told you there are two different kinds of things because the internal actor of the uh, action to cure patients is entirely different. So for all these reasons, we're so proud to propose. Thank you. Running prep, please. All right, is everyone ready? Okay, just a quick off-time roll map. It's gonna go frame, biggest clash, second contention, or second contention.
if everyone's ready, my three-minute summary speech starts now. Our, on our framework, sensitive debates are implementing the legalization of PS into a real world. Practical consequences should always be, be preferred over theoretical benefits. With that being said, onto the biggest clash in today's debate is whether patients have autonomy under a world where PS is legalized. We argue not without contention one perverse incentive, perverse incentive. Thus, if we prove our contention one still stands, we automatically turn to the case about autonomy and dignity. After wrongly response in summary, which is no evidence, no exact number affected. For us, uh, uh, Three, three, extending three front lines from our rebuttal. First, our logic for this argument goes uncont uncontested. Our acting areas called Wage Throughout the Bank tells you insurance companies are inherently profit driven. Thus, decision makers would choose the cheaper assisted suicide every time over providing treatment. As a result, even though there are two options on the table, patients are forced to suicide almost every time. Second, this is no conspiracy theory. We read you examples in case where US patients were denied treatment. Our opponents try to undermine this example by asking for exact number of people affected. However, note it's here, this is reporting disincentive, as my partner mentioned in rebuttal. Remember that when a patient and a doctor are talking, the conversation and all communication be between the patient and the doctor are completely private, especially in the United States where it's called pri privileged co communication. If the, if the doctor doesn't want to treat the patient, no one will ever know what the patient said to the doctor or what the doctor said to the patient. And if the patient co is coerced towards physician assisted suicide, they will be dead, so definitely no one will know. Moreover, in Oregon, a physician member of a pro assisted suicide lobby group provided consultation in 58 of 68 consecutive cases of patients receiving PAS in Oregon, meaning that the only oversight for PAS favors PAS. They have no incentive to re report abuses. Thus, it's hard to get exact number, but does not that does not reduce the impact of our argument. Third, lack of data is not the reason for lack of, la lack of action. Think about it this way. When the virus first hit, we don't have an exact number of people affected. Now a smart government official will take action to prevent the spread of the disease right away. No one in their right, right mind will be like, let's wait and see how many people get affect affected before we do anything. The logic can be applied to PS. We're seeing a trend of more and more patients getting denied treatment, and that's what's important. Now notice here how opponents try to turn our medical shortage warrant. They didn't extend the summary, by the way, saying like PS will solve. No, it does not. As argued in case, after PS is legalized, since it's so good as the proclaims government sees physicians as a suicide as a solution to medical shortages it does no longer have incentive to fund healthcare programs for instance when capital for instance for when caps when hospitals reach maximum capacity with a justified system to kill, they can urge patients to commit suicide. Moreover, recall in case how Oregon terminated funding for health services at, and cut Medicaid funding after PS is legalized, this example was completely dropped. Our tone, uh, now, our opponents tells you, onto our contention too, our opponents tells you that there's no link between f physician assisted suicide and more suicide. Yes, there is. The logic is clear here. The action of physician assisted suicide is like the government publicly condoning suicide. This action removes stigma and normalizes suicide, which results in higher rates of suicide. And this is horrible because of two reasons. First, these are suicides that could have been prevented. There are lives that could have been safe. Second, when we normalize the usage of suicides, no longer the last resort, is the first option people think of with treating terminal patients cross multiply without contention one about medical shortages, which my partner will extend in her summary, in her final focus. Now, lastly, remember that suicide is still possible on the con side, given that it's possible to prevent a person from com committing suicide. In the worst case scenario, patients can su still have the ability to end their lives in suffering if necessary. Rather, con specifically concerned with the widespread harms, abuses, and normalization of suicide resulting from the leg uh, legislation. Thus, we negate. Thank you. May I have the first question? So my time starts now. Let's talk about insurance companies. So even though insurance companies are profit driven, yes, we can see But through the entire time span after the legalization of physician assisted suicide, you can only find two examples. Isn't that directly support over point that regulations are significantly we effective in the status quo? Okay, oh, sorry. So you talked about regulation, but you also didn't respond to my regulation argument about how if you're saying underground PS exists, then regulation in the status quo isn't working, so why would regulation work in your world? Uh, my argumentation was that underground PS exists more in the countries where PS is not legalized, like uh, Australia. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, our response is that if regulation in the status quo is failing, how do you fix those, make those regulations? How would, why would people follow regulations and, in your world? And we, we read you in summary that wait, wait a just second. because we don't have a number doesn't mean anything. I right? understand. The and we argue reporting this incentive. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. The intuitive motivation for any normalized citizen is to seek for legal channel instead of the illegal ones, right? Like, if you have some disease, the first intention would be going to some formal hospital instead of underground doctor, right? Unless you don't have a choice, right? Uh, the sure, first but neither world falls for that. Yeah, I mean, we can... Uh, we already and also, if you want to talk about... You can't, right, right. Yeah. But also, if you want to talk about you can't afford, we told you about autonomy arguments and how about poor and minority patients are going to be especially affected. You guys also didn't respond to this. And wait, wait, like wait, you so, so what's your offer for those who can't afford? Sorry, what? Like, what, what are those poor people going to do? 
Like we, we say, just one sentence? Very right, easy. we say in, it's not unique in both worlds, they can't afford treatment, but in their world, instead of trying to fix the system I to totally make treatment understand. more affordable, in their oh, world, they're okay. being told okay, to die. I think how, we're how, spending, how do you fix we're the system? We're spending a bit too much no, time. No, 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 right. You keep asking us about fixing. We tell you neither world fixes, but in their world, it gets worse. Because yeah. there's a but, less of incentive to fix, and it undermines the thing you're well. fixing. But zero, zero solvency on your side about solving the entire systematic problem as well. Like, you are trying uh, to do what United States, like, okay. president, every can, single can, one of presidents. Can, president can we ask a question? Sure. So, will doctors go around telling people that they denied a dying patient treatment? So, you're suggesting that the justified reason for you not providing a number is because those doctors would never tell people. Then, how do you yeah, know Yeah, exactly. Because this this it's a private conversation. No one the, else would know what the conversation is about, right? So, since no one knows what the conversation is about, then no one knows about the patient's consent, then how do you know it is involuntary? Because we read you examples, like we have, we have One ample, example? we have Two ample pages. examples. We just can't give you an exact number, and but, that's but because also, of reporting. Also, the system. example right, right. out of this, the example out of this is just insurance company suggest PS. No reasoning about whether it is the financial coercion from insurance okay. company that directly calls. Right. The okay. Death. So what other reason would they be denied treatment? If For they example, could their it. family, like their family burden, they truly don't have that much money. What are you going to no, do? No, 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 no. If no, they no. could afford it. Yeah. They asked for it, they said we can pay for it, yeah. but we deny you. What other reason would there be? Yeah. Would there be, it's probably it's too much incurable and the patients think there's too much suffering there that don't no. worth tolerating. No, no they the patients asked want for it, it yeah, they but they're want being treatment. denied. Yeah. And then are they dead at the very end? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, so pretty, I'm pretty sure because then that is not, the only yeah. option then is physician-assisted suicide. That is so there's really no autonomy in your side. Uh, the rest of crap, do we still have? Okay. Right, so um, pro final focus. Starting now, the very only support the defense argumentation our opponents mentioned about their firm is talking about realistic situation. While they just concede that they don't have any actual number to quantify their own impact in the reality, which means our frame of moral principle and social benefits still wins. Now, moving on to the first and biggest clash regarding coercion. First, we already told you the entire insurance argumentation is pure speculation. The only example we see is now insurance companies suggest and finally they probably die, but the causation of this is unclear. And we also tell you we're generating 990 million. We're turning their entire financial argument altogether. And regarding suicidal contingency, we already provide you three evidences. Right. Uh, the reason why like legalizing PS doesn't mean normalizing and justifying PS, we're actually suggesting only a few of those incurable and special people would actually choose it. We're offering this option to a few to a few special patients who, could, uh, who couldn't be curing any of the traditional Medicare settings. Now moving on to their alternative, we already told you how ineffective traditional Medicare is. And that's why even if we're harming the traditional medical funding, it doesn't matter because PAS would be a better option for them. We already told you for only 14% who need to access palliative care, 63% of which report low quality of care, and 60K a cost per, uh, per year, which is the American household average income. Now, even if you don't buy any of these responses, would turn your entire argumentation by two completely dropped arguments the first one is underground PS. We already told you in Australia where PS is illegal. It has five times higher involuntary euthanasia rate compared to Netherlands with 0.7%. And second, we'll tell you about pain mass overdose. We're telling you that when physicians have no choice, since PS is not legalized, they, they have no choice but to overprescribe pain relief medication to those patients, which already cost 150,000 deaths. Our opponents totally dropped this entire argumentation throughout the entire debate. Now moving on to our social benefits. Not only have we already talked about end of suffering, talking about their traditional Medicare couldn't stop it, and we talk, also talked about about 990 million, 20K for each of these family, 5% of entire Canadian donation, uh, like resort from PS patients. Our opponents are only criticizing the entire systematic problem, blaming everything on the government without providing any solvency to how we are gonna resolve this structural violence altogether. We on the other side, however, pro uh, pro proposing a extra option for those patients with their free will. Thank you. So if everybody is ready, 
my time will start now. First, let's talk about the small clash about solvency. We tell you no world has solvency again and again, but in their world, it gets worse because it undermines incentive for solvency. Now, going into an argument about abuse, we win because we give you evidence of an impact. They say we can't give us a number of everyone, their only response. We tell you that doesn't matter because our impact just exists. We have proof, and we tell you we actually have evidence. Let's remind you of the evidence we continuously extend. We extend Callister patients, Acton patients, Oregon lobbyists convince people to PAS in 59 consecutive cases. We also tell you reporting this incentive, which goes ignored. Now, uh, now onto, here's why they don't win their main argument about dignity and autonomy. The crux of autonomy in their case, the only reason they provide more autonomy is because of the right to die. We tell you we actually achieve right to die. They, they say that it's harder in our world, but we say that's not bad. We also tell you autonomy doesn't exist because of abuse. They told us evidence, which we already told you why the evidence response doesn't matter. Um, if you're picking, also if you're picking light death over life, then a painful death wouldn't outweigh a painful life, right? We would say that's okay. This applies to all their underground death methods, overdose, etc. Also, we responded about regulation fails, which was ignored after rebuttal. Now, going on to our case and why we win every single time. Legalizing PAS normalizes suicide as solvency and undermines other solvency by accepting the last resort as standard. The impact of this is that it undermines treatment and the most important thing in this debate, it goes virtually unresponded to because their only response is palliative care or they try to challenge our link, which doesn't cover the scope of our argument and their challenge to our link failed. We tell you legalizing PAS lessens incentive to create medical solvency. We tell you about Oregon, where hundreds of medical treatments were slashed after the legalization of suicide, card went untouched. We tell you about pain reduction treatment worsening after legalizing PAS, they also didn't respond to this, which means we're further tunneling into a mindset that already exists within the status quo that we should call instead of call instead of cure and forget instead of fix. They didn't respond to our medical shortage warrant where you tell you that save resources in the status quo, they call the weak, weakest patients. Suicide increases for people who could have been saved. PAS should be a last resort option and the second it is not, we offer it to people. We allow lobbyists to go consult. That is when our impact starts rolling out. To weigh a little bit, a little bit on this is life versus death. You vote for protection of life over the protection of death every time. But even if you don't, we access right to die anyway. So during the weighing, you vote for us across the board. We know people are in pain, but we just can't actively help them kill themselves. And we can't actively legalize the process, which is why every single time you're voting con. Thank you. have feedbacks for <laughs> short answer no sorry uh, we don't have enough time for feedback because the award ceremony is going to be starting soon um, and we have seven judges but they'll be writing the feedback and I don't know about the other judges but it's probably going to take me a while to make my decision uh, so uh, I don't think we have time for the feedback anyways, but great job for both of you. Congratulations um, And as soon as we get done, we will start the award ceremony uh, Award ceremony will begin at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. <laughs>